All right, so I was gifted these beautiful framing chisels. They're made by James Warnock. He was a Galt, Ontario toolmaker. Um, my wife and I lived in Galt for seven years or so, so that's kind of cool. These are beautiful chisels. I'm honored. Um, the, the person gave them to me. They had been her father's, and she wanted them to go to someone, not just who would collect them, but who would actually put them to use. And I was very happy to do that. Uh, but it means some major repairs. Uh, two of the three need major repairs. Here's the first one. First of all, it has a big chunk out of the out of the corner, so that's obviously going to have to be fixed. And then the second one is that the the edge is not in line or not perpendicular to the chisel blade. So here's a 3D mock-up I made of what the blade should look like, and here's a 3D mock-up coming up in a moment of what mine looks like. It's a single bevel back chisel, but of course here there's a piece missing. So I had to decide what I'm going to do about this. Well, what are the options? Could it be milled, I thought. Well, I don't have a milling machine or experience milling, so that would mean I have to take it to a professional and pay for that, which I didn't really want to do. Secondly, in order to be milled, it would have to be softened first uh, so that the milling could be done, the, the metal could be cut, and then it would have to be hardened again. Um, and that's a little bit out of my realm because I don't have the tools for that. Cutting? Uh, well, cutting, you could potentially take off. If you get the angle wrong, you may take away a lot more material than you want to. But more importantly, cutting generates a lot of heat. And you'll see, I'm going to repeatedly go back to this, that you, you really want to control the heat when you're working on the, on the chisel. Um, so I didn't want to cut. Grinding. Well, grinding is a pain in the butt because it's super slow. But it's a good option because... First of all, it allows the heat to dissipate. It doesn't build up quickly, and so it doesn't run the risk of damaging the heat treat, and that's why we don't want the blade to heat up. We don't want to damage the heat treat and cause it to become soft. It also doesn't require special tools to grind, so that's what I opted for. So what do we have to do? We have to grind away any metal on a 90-degree plane uh, to the blade where the chip exists so that we have a flat front surface. Then we have to recreate the bevel again, the original bevel. Which is not that bad, actually. It just means hours and hours of grinding. But it's not complicated. So, when I say grinding, let's think about this. You probably, the first thing that might come to your mind is bench grinder. The problem is, we need to make this, see the blue line? We need to make this flat a surface. But a bench grinder has a, a round stone on it. So that's going to create a cove shaped grind, which is no good to us. We need this flat plane. Secondly, bench grinders, unless they're designed specifically for sharpening, are way too fast and generate way too much heat and they'll soften the, the chisel, which will ruin it. So time to get a bevel gauge and figure out what the bevel is so that I can grind a new one at the right angle. And as you can see, I opted for a belt sander to do this. Now, disclaimer, I always suggest that it's a bad idea to use tools in ways they weren't designed. Obviously, this belt sander is designed to be handheld, not clamped to a bench. So, do as I say, not as I do. Um, it's your own risk kind of thing. So, hours and hours of grinding and checking the temperature. Grinding and checking the temperature over and over and over. And it was tedious. It's so important. I would let the temperature get as high as 400 degrees. That's where I would always back off put the tool in water and let it cool. The reason is, if you get to 575, that's about the temperature where steel starts to soften. If you reach 575 degrees on a heat-treated tool, like every chisel will be, then you undo the heat treatment, which means you soften the metal, which means it will never hold an edge, and it will no longer function as a chisel. So, turned out pretty well. I'm happy with it. For doing it by hand, I'm, I'm, I'm quite satisfied. It's going to be a usable tool. Now, when you're grinding, heat builds up. Now, I was willing to go to 400, because at 400, no damage done. But, see these oxidization 
the colors they're changing, that represents what happens to the steel when you're heating it. You start to see it change color. When you get to 575, which is where it turns blue, that's when you've reached the temperature that will completely soften the metal. So if any portion of the metal turns blue, or you measure 575 degrees Fahrenheit, you've just put yourself back significantly because now you've softened the metal, which means now it won't work as a chisel unless you have it hardened again. So after the grind was done, uh, then it proceeded to take all the rust off. And it's important to get all of the rust off because you want to see if there are any defects that maybe aren't visible through the rust. And there were. There were some fissures, which is just a word for cracks, basically. Two of them that I found, one in the neck and one at the end of the socket. So what I did was I, as you can see here, stick welded them closed. And it's important to do that. It's very important to do that because any fissure, especially in, in a tool that's designed to be struck with a mallet such as this one, will eventually result in a fracture. And that means broken tool and potentially injured tool user. So welded those all up and ground them back down nice, polished them, and that takes care of the repair on that chisel. Now the other blade had a big bend in it. Somebody had obviously tried to pry something or whatever. Uh, the blue line is a straight line. You can see from the red area, that's the, the arch of the blade. So let's back up. You won't understand initially why I'm talking about this, but it'll make sense later. Metals are made of crystals. And you remember from high school that crystals are made up of these lattices. They call them periodic because they have repeating patterns of molecules, right? Uh, unlike amorphous things like liquids, for example where the molecules are all just sort of jumbled together. More specifically, metals are polycrystals, which means there are a whole bunch of very tiny little single crystals stuck together. So in this diagram, you see four individual crystals separated by what they call crystal boundaries. That's just a schematic representation. It's certainly a very simplified one. So that's an up-close image of metal. Each of those individual sections is a single crystal, and the black perimeters are the boundaries between each crystal. And they call each of those crystals grains. What's important from this, and the reason I'm bringing it up, is I want you to think of bending metal. Now, when you bend metal, you imagine the whole thing bending, because that's what we see on the macro level. But what's really happening is the individual crystals, or each grain as they call them, is being compressed on one side and, and, and tension applied on the other. But the boundaries in between the crystals are what make up the limiting factor in the bending. Okay. So keep that in mind, and now let's move on, and you'll see later why I brought that up. This is an arbor press, and I'm going to do a test with this. An arbor press is simply for pushing down on things. It's got a handle right here. It's got a ram down here. I pull on the handle, the ram gets pressed down. I put a dial indicator on top of the ram, and that's going to tell me how much the ram is moving uh, in thousandths of an inch. So what I want to figure out is, is there any point in heating up the blade before I bend it? Will that make it easier to bend? So I got a piece of test metal that's just some 4140 steel. Pulled on the handle and deflected it 10 one thousandths to an inch, or I, I call them milli inches because it's just easier to say. What I found was it takes about 34 pounds of pressure on, on that particular setup that I put together here to get 10 milli inches of deflection. I did it a number of times, I got the same result every time. Then I thought, okay, let's heat it up and repeat the experiment and see, or repeat the process and see if we get the same results. So I heated it to 400 degrees. And I'll tell you, 400 degrees is a safe area, is a safe temperature where you don't run the risk of damaging the heat treat. You don't soften the metal at 400 degrees. We'll talk more about it later. So here, all I'm doing is heating it until I see 400 degrees, put it back under the ram, pull on the handle, and I found that to get 10 uh, thousandths, excuse me, or mil milli inches of deflection, I had to get about, I needed about 34 pounds again of pressure. I guess I should say tension. So, what that meant to me was, based on this experiment, there's no point in heating the, 
the chisel before trying to bend it because it won't change anything unless I heat it to the point where I could potentially risk softening it, which is not what we want to do. So, away we go, cold bending this chisel, little bit by little bit, just putting a bit more pressure, a bit more pressure. Initially, what would happen is I would put a little bit of pressure and let go, and then it would spring back into place. That's called like elastic bending, where it springs back. So I would keep adding a bit more pressure, a bit more pressure, until I got into the plastic bending, which just means it takes on a new shape because you exceed the elastic modulus and that's what we needed to do because we need to get it from curved to straight you saw that in this in this particular shot and with enough very careful uh, nervous pressing down on the blade i eventually got it straight that was quite satisfying now remember we talked about how each individual crystal in there gets compressed that compression in there stays in there as in internal stress so when your spouse is not home put it in the toaster oven heat it up to 400 degrees fahrenheit for two hours and walk away and let it air cool and that will relieve the internal stresses on the metal on to handles i contemplated carving the handle by hand because I know that not everyone has a metal lathe, or pardon me, a, a wood lathe, but I wanted to do it on the lathe, so that's what I did. I figured most people could potentially, you know, have a friend that has a lathe, hopefully. And if not, then you'll have to carve one, that's all. I've, done, I've carved many tool handles. Not much to it. I mean, everyone knows what kind of shape you're going for. It's a basic handle for a power grip. I'm going to need tenons, of course, on both ends, and one tenon on, on the front end, which goes into the socket of the chisel, one tenon on the back end for the metal hoop to prevent splitting when you're pounding on it with a, pounding on the handle with a mallet. That's just some Rubio mono coat. I call it Rubio multi coat because it just works so much better when you use multiple coats. Obviously removing it from the, uh, from the blank. I, underestimated the, the diameter of the, um, the inside of the socket, so I had to whittle away a bit more off this tenon. I looked up online for which glue to use to attach the handle in the socket, and there were, most people seem to be saying either CA or polyurethane, which I found interesting because I would have guessed uh, epoxy. But People said CA was good, and I had some on hand, so that's what I used. I also used that for the hoop. All I did was I got a piece of stainless steel water pipe fitting, cut it, and ground it down a little bit by hand, and then it made a nice little steel hoop that I could wrap around this tenon. And then it's just a matter of cleaning it up, and we have ourselves uh, all the repairs done. So I hope that gave you some insight into how, how to do repairs to chisels. I'm really happy with the result. Looks a heck of a lot better than it did when they were given to me. And I can't thank the person enough because I'm really looking forward to putting these to use. To putting them to use. Use. Jeez. Sound like uh, my cousin Vinny. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'll catch you at the next one. Take care.